it's time you realize the need to specialize. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Mr. Mark Mowinney. Mark lost it all. We jump right into it. Uh, he was a victim of the real estate uh, debacle. Now, he made some money, but uh, he lost it all. But you know what? Uh, he has a great story on how he built that back, uh, not in real estate, but built himself back. Uh, we get into the need for coaches and mentors. Or, you know, do you need a life coach, a business coach, whatever, uh, and how to turn um, your failures around. And he has some unique insight on how failures really do, really can help you um, if you are moving into uh, a business coaching type world, uh, you know, moving into that space. Uh, but even if you're not, if you're hiring someone uh, to help you, uh, this will be uh, informative for you. Uh, but if you are just in sales in general, uh, this number one thing that we talk about, uh, this number one trait, uh, I talk about it in my better prospecting system, bonding, empathy, trust, and rapport. Uh, it's part of the Make Every Sale program. Uh, but you need to understand the role in this one thing, like I said, that he learns from his failures uh, and how it's going to make you um, a better salesperson, a better consultant, a better business coach. Uh, I think it'll just make you a better human being. All right. So you're in for a treat. Get ready to take some notes. Let's bring on Mark. Mark Mawinney, the Tony Robbins Me Too expert. Welcome to the sales podcast, man. How the heck are you? How are you doing? I got to <laughs> leave now. I couldn't help but open with that. You just gave it to me. You just gave it to me. <laughs> you are not the Tony Robbins Me Too expert, and neither am I, but you're all the way in Canada, and you run. I got a few things here. I got a few things here. Uh, the Coaching Jungle, the Mark Mawinney Minute Podcast, Natural Born Coaches Podcast, the real ABCs of successful coaching business. Now, can I just grow a sexy beard like you and I can become a, a well-known author and coach and consultant? Is that, is that well, all it takes? My, my last interview I did uh, just recently, the woman said to me, uh, you know, you look like Mark Hamill, you know, Luke Skywalker. But she was talking about episode eight from The Last Jedi when he's a depressed hermit on the, <laughs> on the island and stuff. She wasn't going to talk about when he saved the galaxy in uh, Return of the Jedi. It's like, geez, but thanks, I think, you know. And I've gotten Kiefer Sutherland before, too, so. So I, I wasn't. That's all right. Well, yeah, twenty-four guy, but yeah, I suppose uh, you know, go for it. I recommend that every man should try beard at least once in his life just to see if it fits. That's what I did. I'd never had you know beard till I don't know ten years ago or eight years ago. I said, oh, let's give it a try, and here we are. Well, you're in Canada, man. It works. I, I, I'm in SoCal, yes. and oh, God. if I had a, if I grow a beard, I got to grow long hair. I got to get loop earrings. Yeah, I have to learn how to surf. Uh, and I have to forget how to use my hands and do anything, you know, manly. But uh, so talk about some haters. Well, well I, have a, I have a twin brother too, so that, uh, he doesn't have a beard. So that was the extra motivation. If you get if you get tired of it after living so many years with a twin brother, now I can just say, yeah, I'm the one with the beard. You know, he he doesn't have the scruff. So there's the other motivation for it. Very nice. So man, how did you get into this? How did you become this uh, coach's coach? Well, I, I'll say a disclaimer first. A joke you made about Tony Robbins and me too was uh, just so anyone's wondering. What, I'd said to Wes that I've been uh, no controversy or whatever. So he picked the most controversial thing in the coaching <laughs> world to start with. Uh, how did I get started with it? I mean, it, make a long story short, my background's in real estate. So I did that for almost a decade and built throughout my 20s, built my business up and it was going very well till it wasn't going well. Everything collapsed and it, to make a really, really long story short, uh, I was helped back to my feet by several coaches and mentors. And by then I was burned out of real estate. I said, I'm done with it. Don't want to do it. But I got looking at this coaching thing and where I actually benefited firsthand from it. I said, hey, I'm going to give it a whirl. And here we are. That was back early 2014. Oh, wow. Okay. And so did you go and get like 47 different degrees and 87 different certifications and, and 412 uh, different accreditations uh, to make this happen? 
you, you look at my certifications on the wall behind me. So where this is a podcast, anyone not watching the video, I, I'm being sarcastic because I don't have any certification. <laughs> he has and, his own uh, poster behind him. <laughs> yeah, I spent 40 bucks. To lam- I, I laminated my natural born coaches poster. There's my certification. I, and I can't say I've ever had a person say I'm ready to hire you, Mark, but before I pay you via PayPal, can you send over a copy of your certification? So there are good ones out there. Don't get me wrong, but I do think that um, it, it's definitely not necessary with it. I always say mine comes from the school of hard knocks. So where I've gone through business closures, sleepless nights, people wanting to, um, I say people wanting to kill me. That That's probably an exaggeration. People who are very angry at me, <laughs> critics, haters, and everything else. So I've kind of seen it all. And, and I actually learned that a lot from that. That actually made me a better coach. Uh, here for doing this. But I always say, um, if you're not doing certifications, you got to be investing in yourself. So me, I don't have certifications, but I spend a fortune, thousands of dollars a year on programs, books, seminars, everything, because you always have to be growing. So it's not enough to say, oh, I don't want to do any certifications and not spend any money on personal development. You got to keep growing. Uh, Someone said to me once, you have to outlearn your clients. That's what we have to do as coaches. So yeah. Yeah, we could do a whole show on certifications. Anytime it's mentioned, that's a big, uh, it's like Lord of the Flies in my Facebook group. Whenever that's brought up, it's everyone kicking everyone and fighting. (laughs) Well, it's true. And and, and there are people who, they they, they prey on people, I guess is a way to put it. Because there there are some good accreditations and there's a lot of, of BS ones or you're talking about real estate. I mean, I had a real estate license when I was in Texas and I was flipping houses. I was rehabbing some, I built some spec homes. Uh, I got my license just to save on fees. And, but going through that process, they didn't teach me how to sell or market, right? They just, yeah. the licensing just really got me scared on, you know, be careful with your paperwork or you'll get sued. It's basically. Yeah. And that's what a lot of coaching certifications are like. They do 90% of what they're teaching is the art of coaching and all this stuff. But then there's very little there for how to actually get clients. And I have worked with people before who came out of certain certifications so depressed and because they've been doing buddy coaching calls for a year or two years, all these calls and and it stopped feeling real because they hadn't worked with any real clients. They were just doing these practice calls and studying in the textbooks. Everything oh. else. I say, you got to just get out there. The best way to become a better coach is coach, right? And, and just do it. Well, okay. Let's break that down. Cause I, it could be a little easier said than done. I mean, how do you go from, it's like you were in real estate uh, and you were successful and then you weren't successful. Right. And then how do you make that switch even if somebody was already successful, let's say they're successful in real estate and they're like, you know what? I, I'm tired. I, I want to make a change. Um, how, how do you make that switch? How do you say, I'm not going to go teach people. I'm going to help people. I want to mentor people. Um, now, in your case, you're coming off of a loss. How do you get that confidence to know that you bring value? And then how do you know how to charge for it? Yeah, it was tricky for me because I had gone through that previous decade, no failure, no stumbles. It was beginning to feel too easy. Yeah, I did a ton of work, ton of hours, but I always joke around. I thought by the time I turned 40, I'd be a billionaire with private islands and planes and everything else because it was just going that well with it. And when everything collapsed, there was that little voice in my head that thought, who are you to be a business coach? You just went through this whole messy you know, thing and you had this rough period. Uh, what I always tell people, regardless of what um, niche or what industry you're in, you probably have a lot more experience, a lot of more than you realize in your noggin. So there's people who are in different industries, been doing it for 20, 30 years. They got a wealth of knowledge, but they never realize that, hey, I'm good enough to actually help other people with this, uh, unfortunately. And they could easily add coaching as a stream of revenue or stream of income to what they're doing so you have to push past that little voice i dealt with it as well but i turned it into a positive i said hey this is something that's again made me more empathetic a better coach and you know it's funny you probably find this west with being in the podcasting world i used to think my story was so rare and outlandish and crazy my story is boring compared to some of the guests i've interviewed for my show i've dealt with people who've been in prison who've um People who, uh, one of them in particular was a promising uh, college athlete, and he literally had a tree go through his windshield, take off half his face. 
and now he's a motivational speaker. I'm like, man, my story is boring. People, people who were living in dumpsters and drinking sewer water and eating rats. And <laughs> I yeah. just went through business closure. <laughs> right. So how do you wrap your brain around that though? If somebody's sitting around and, and you're right. I mean, I would say every single person, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's, let's pick an age over the age of 25 that has overcome anything. Right. And certainly they could be younger than that if they've endured something, but that, I don't know. We have, have a bit of a mentality that, you know, I, I overcame a, a dead iPhone battery when uh, I was about to order at my yeah. Starbucks and number of first world problems. Yeah. yeah. I, I found a charger and I was able to, you know, get my Frappuccino, cappuccino, caramel, macchiato, soy, 182 degrees, no froth, uh, just in the nick of time. So if you've done anything bigger than that, mm. you have a story, you can coach somebody and help somebody through their own challenges. But, but still, we're, we're all just, we're, we're doing our thing. We're, we're living, we're paying the bills, uh, trying to get to the gym, trying to kind of eat right, trying to have a family, whatever. Uh, and then it's like, you mean somebody will pay me $100 an hour or $200 an hour or join a $10,000 mastermind program to learn from little old me? Mm. I mean, that's, that's a big leap for a lot of people. Yeah. And not everyone should be a coach. I know that's sure. hard, hard to realize nowadays because you look online and Facebook everywhere else and there's a lot of them are the certifications saying, yeah, you could be a coach or whatever. Um, but it, that's just like saying uh, not everyone could be a doctor, NBA player. I'd be a horrible NBA player. I'm a tad over five foot nine and I'm white, <laughs> you know, and uh, I don't know. Maybe I could be a point guard for the Jazz. Was it John Stockton? I forget. Yep. Um, yeah, with it. But uh, not everyone can be a coach. So there's people, if you hate people, for example, it's probably not the right fit. Um, there's a lot of people who are jumping into the coaching world now that never want to talk to a real live person. They, right away, day one, they want to be selling information, products and programs, digital stuff, where they're making money while they sleep. And there's a saying I heard, which I love, is you, before you can make money while you sleep, you got to be able to make it while you're awake. So that's why <laughs> I started, right? Now, I got the experience of coaching one-on-one -on -one in groups, and then I added online programs and a print newsletter subscription and all that down the road. But I made sure I got enough coaching, in, especially in the early days. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They, they don't want to coach. They just want to be information marketers. Yeah. So, so if somebody is wanting to make that transition, though, I mean, would you recommend a, kind of, I, I guess the phrase is a side hustle, right? Let's say somebody is a realtor. Hmm. Should, they, should they try coaching other real estate agents? Should they try to just open up a general coaching mentoring program for just entrepreneurs or salespeople in general and do that on the side uh, while they're running their real estate business? you know, before they can go full-time in the other? Like, how, like, what's that first initial step? Well, there's nothing wrong with building it as a side hustle. I think that's smart. And that goes against the grain because a lot of people think, no, you got to tell your boss to shove it and you storm out of the office. But the, the problem there is the next day you need that client to pay the bills. You're going to take on somebody you don't want to work with that you shouldn't be working with. So there's nothing wrong with building up as a side hustle. Now, don't do it for 10 years shouldn't take 10 years to do it but i've had plenty of clients have taken three six months nine months taking their time till they're ready to jump and even when i started my coaching business i was working with a telecommunications company here in canada doing sales it was home-based it was a great gig all my friends said oh my god that's an awesome gig i'm like no i'm not passionate about it i built my coaching on the side and then i made the the leap when my coaching revenue passed what I was doing with that job. And that, that's probably smart. I didn't put pressure on myself because I knew the bills were going to get paid there as well. But uh, to answer your question of if, who they should coach, I say uh, never go the general route because it, I think it is important to niche down, but go based on your experience, on your interests. If you're in real estate, as long as you don't hate it, if you're good at what you do and stuff, great help other real estate agents. You know, if you build up a successful real estate business, you could help agents in other parts of the country. You're not helping people rate on your home market that are your competition. 
Uh, Ray Woods, a guy I know, he's doing big things for coaching or for real estate agents around the world with Top Agents Playbook as a show and stuff. That's all he's doing. He's helping real estate agents sell more. So using that example, that's uh, that's how I would do it. And so when you're working with people now, though, I mean, you're not just focused on real estate, even though that was your background, right? No, I specifically hate real estate. No, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> but I stay away from it. I've worked with two clients who've been in the real estate world more by accident, and that's over the years. I don't target. I did have people saying, oh, gee, you should be coaching real estate agents and stuff. And I'm like, man, I want to get away from real estate. Part of it was I felt like I was pigeonholed from that's all I'd done my whole adult life was real estate. Uh, right out of university, became a real estate agent and did that for years. And I really felt restricted because everyone said, oh, Mark's a real estate guy. So now years later, I've finally shaken that label, but I don't want to go back to it. So I have worked with a handful of coaches to help them that are they're in the real estate world, but they're coaches in the real estate world. They're not real estate agents. One's a, co- one's a coach that helps real estate agents. The other is one that helps real estate investors. And I'm helping them with their businesses. But no, I, I don't want to do anything with real estate. I've been there, did it, done it, got the t-shirt. Right. So what is your niche now if you had to really? It's come, I, I say for lack of better term, I'm coach who coaches coaches. But um, when I started, I was general entrepreneur said, I'll be a business coach for any entrepreneurs. And what I found out really quickly is I didn't enjoy working with uh, certain, you know, the, the Joe from Joe's widgets, you know, um, that's in the bricks and mortar type business. I had a couple clients who were coaches. I preferred them working with them much more than traditional businesses. So I made a decision at some point down the road where I said, you know what, I'm only going to work with coaches. I'll refer anyone else off. And I still do that to this day. If someone hears my podcast and they reach out and, hey, Mark, I, for example, I had someone who owned um, clinics. He was in psychiatry in Baltimore. He re- heard my podcast somehow and he reached out to me and I just said, look, I, I don't do that. I only work with coaches, but here's a guy to talk to and I referred him off. Gotcha. So like a a brick and mortar owner, store owner, I mean, that's just not who you're going after. No, that's right. And there's more than I could probably niche down even further. Right now, I I deal with coaches across the board, all different types of them. But I could probably say, hey, I'm only going to help X coaches, a certain type of coach. But it works. It works for me with what I'm doing. And um, I always say just you got to niche down. You see a lot of people are life coaches. And not to knock them because I know they're passionate, they want to do good and stuff, but it's really tough to get out there as a life coach because there's millions of them. It's tough to get your head above the crowd. But but we need people to be alive so we can coach them. So shouldn't <laughs> I be a life coach? Yeah, I don't want right. to be a dead coach. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say niche, niche down, but don't get so niched uh, that you're saying I'm I'm going to work with left-handed Dennis, Nate, and Bob from Idaho who are recently divorced and selling their business in the next six months. That's a little too niche down. <laughs> Hold on. Let me do a Google search. I mean, <laughs> yeah. There could be a dentist like that. I don't know if I'd want him <laughs> operating or doing anything with my mouth, though. Might be a little depressed. <laughs> so how are you – getting the word out now because you talk about noisy i mean it, it is a crowded space social media is crazy uh it's now a pay-to-play arena you know there's facebook pages there's facebook groups there's facebook private groups there's slack channels there's just golly it seems like it keeps moving uh you know private membership sites wordpress kajabi yeah. i mean where do you where do you put stuff you know to uh, and get the attention of such a fragmented, hectic world? Well, me personally, I have three ways I'm getting business. It's through, um, one of them is through podcasting. So I have two podcasts and an Alexa flash briefing. So when I say podcasting, I mean as a host or doing like shows like this where I'm a guest. So I got podcasting, I've got Facebook. And, and when I say Facebook, the Facebook group's a big part of it. The Coaching Jungle's my group. There's 13,000 some coaches in there. And then the third way is email marketing, but daily emails, that's my thing. I've been doing that now for almost two and a half years. So I'm a big fan of daily emails. So if I'm doing the podcasting, Facebook, and emailing daily, I know that I'm good. Uh, but one thing I will say, you mentioned that, that social media is pay to play, but 
actually I built my business up with like organic, not doing paid ads. And that's what I help coaches do as well. That's kind of my hook is I help coaches get more clients without paid ads. It just means that you have to make up for that lack of ad spend with a lot of rolling up your sleeves, putting the effort in there to create content, get your message out there, but it is possible to build up without paying. Um, so, so like your group, you've got, um, I've got multiple tabs here. Look at that handsome mug. I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of distracted looking yeah. at that profile. Is that, is that my Tarzan? Oh, I thought you were looking at the banner for the group, me and Tarzan and Garb. If anyone wants to see a cartoon Mark and Tarzan Garb, go over to the coaching jungle. <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah. So now, so you've got two, right? You've got the... Oh, no, that's your page. All right, that's your page for your podcast, but then you also have the group. But the group, is it free? Yes. It's free, but it's private, right? People have to answer a few questions and get get opted in? Um, Well, they have to request to join. I don't make them answer questions, but we've got a few criteria. So my um, DAs know that uh, not to accept anyone without a profile picture. If you're a member of over 250 groups, they won't accept you. If you, um, oh, wow. yeah, if, if you, uh, so no profile picture that, uh, you can see that about somebody. Yeah. When they request to join, we've had literally people request to join. They've been in 1800 groups or more or like 2,100. It's just, it's like, gee, I wonder if this person's a spammer. If they just joined Facebook within the last month, we don't accept them in there. So they don't have to say that they're a coach because some people could be interested in coaching and they may not be one already but we need to make sure that they're a real live person, not a bot or a fake. Yeah. Well, there's a ton of that. So, so how active are you in that group? I mean, daily postings, yeah. multiple times a day, three to four a day. And then some days it could be even a tad more. Now I'm cheating a bit. One of them's a scheduled theme post, but the others are actually me posting in there. But yeah, I've heard from a few people who are in the know with Facebook. I'm not friends with Mark Zuckerberg or anything, but they say three to four is that magic number in your Facebook group. So it's not enough. Four or five years ago, you could get away with posting once every couple of days probably, and you, you it wouldn't kill you. Nowadays, you got to be in there every day. And if you're not being active in there, why will anyone else be active? Because you're the group owner and you're not paying any attention to it. So as an outsider, I'm thinking, holy cow, what interesting things. Can I be interesting four or five times a day? <laughs> like I, I got to get my energy. I got to get a running start to be interested, like interesting every four or five months, four or five times a day. How do you do it? Well, some of the contents repackaged. So for example, my daily emails, I usually put it over into the Facebook group. So I think that's smart if you can repackage some of your content. I find the more uh, content you're creating gets easier. So it's kind of like going to the gym. I'm not terribly consistent with the gym. I do have a great week and a bad week, great week. But when it comes to content, I'm doing it every day. So it it does get easier the more that you do it uh, that way. But it doesn't have to be the meaning of life or anything earth shattering. I think a lot of people make that mistake where, oh, I got to post something that's going to knock people's socks off. My stuff doesn't knock people's socks off. I'm posting things to make people think, teaching a lesson, telling a story, entertaining, but it's not like it's a meaning of life. They got to pay to get the meaning of life. I have, no, I'm just kidding. going to pitch my, my other group that has a meaning of life in there. You can pay 10 grand, you can get it. Very nice. So well, that brings up the next point, you know, so, so you're engaging them, you're entertaining them. How do you make that transition to them being a paying client? Well, I think you have to start set the tone early on. So when they join, they're seeing the rules on the side of the group and everything else. I'm very clear. Hey, we don't allow promotion on the wall here. There's scheduled theme days to keep in those posts. But by the way, I'm promote my stuff regularly. And if you're not cool with that, you should probably leave. So I'm saying it right off the hop. Hey, I'm in business, you know, spoiler alert. And that's a trade off. I build a community that's giving a lot of good stuff for free. 13,000 some people 
the trade-off is I'm selling to that community at times uh, just because I'm in business. But so that's the first thing. A lot of Facebook group owners shoot themselves in the foot right off the hop by saying, I had a past client do this. I was ready to strangle him. I was in his group and he said, Hey guys, welcome to my group. I'm not going to, this group isn't going to be like other ones out there. I will never sell to you. And I'm thinking, Oh, geez. And so in a year he built it up to 1100 people, but he had the worst collection of free pull and cheap pull that gathered into that group that I was watching them. And he ended up having to just abandon the group. He left it with another guy and he started another group, but he did it the right way. Right off the hop, he was making offers and he wasn't setting that expectation that he wouldn't be selling in there. So, uh, but, but I mean, to answer your question for the switch to monetization, uh, you could do things like joint uh, venture webinars. So, you know, you're a sales pro Wes, if you've got some sort of product that will help coaches because coaches have to sell great. We do a joint webinar in there and I get affiliate commissions for that. Or I do Facebook lives promoting. I have a print newsletter subscription. I, the last two weeks of every month, I talk a lot about it because it goes to the printer the last day of the month. So you can monetize it, but you can't be afraid of your group. You got to sell to it. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Cause there, there's so much happy talk and good feelings and, and I'm all for that, but man, you got to make money. If you're not in business, if you don't save yourself, you can't save anybody else. Yeah. There's too many people, not just coaches, any online entrepreneur, they're just regurgitating uh, Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey quotes, Brendan Bouchard, Les Brown, and they're sending it. And don't get me wrong. I love motivational quotes, but I would rather hear from you West, as opposed to that Jim Rohn quote that I've heard 844 times in my life. I could Google that and get those motivational quotes. And it means putting your personality out there too. So I put my personality out there. I don't want to be boring. I say there's that mushy middle. A lot of coaches are stuck in there. They're afraid of offending and polarizing. You should drive people away from you and you got to can't be in the mushy middle. It's better to have half the people love you. Half the people hate you. Yeah. I always talk about, you know, magnets attract the same power that they repel. Yeah, exactly. So good example. I think you're in Ben Settle's group, right? Is that where we were talking before? Yeah. I got to talk to Ben. Were you booted? <laughs> I had him on the show, man. I made mm -hmm. one comment about sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and i got kicked out uh, over a year ago so oh, maybe okay. uh, maybe he'll forgive me and let me back in well, yes yeah, tough uh yeah tough uh administrators uh, okay well he has a new group now so my it's not the old one you might oh, okay. have heard out of the old one but i use ben as an example someone who polarizes and isn't afraid oh, yeah. i mean oh god he just He's, he has a target audience, and he's not afraid he'll go after feminists, social justice warriors, just a bunch of people there. And it means he's got a lot of raving fans. You know, I love his stuff, and I reference him regularly, but he's got a lot of people that hate him and think that he's horrible. But he has a great business, and it's better to do it that way than try to please everybody, which is impossible anyways. But there's way too many boring online entrepreneurs, and they need to step out and take some stronger stances and ruffle some feathers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's too easy. That Mushy Metal is a good name. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, we were talking about Dan Kennedy. That Doesn't he reference the, uh, like the mediocre majority or – one well, Dan Kennedy, one of his recent newsletters, I was reading it, and he literally said in the newsletter, he said, thank God we have a president now like Donald Trump that isn't uh, afraid of being politically incorrect. And he put a right. pro-Trump thing in there. And uh, that takes balls the way people are nowadays, right? You say Donald Trump, that just triggers everybody. And there's an example of somebody who's done very well with polarization. You never see anyone who's in the middle with Donald Trump. If you say, hey, what do you think of President Trump? It's never like, oh, he's okay. I'm kind of feeling it out. I'm waiting to see how he does. It's either they think he can walk on water or he's Satan. And it's never anywhere in the middle, right? Yeah. And uh, that's probably a big reason why he's president at the moment. But Dan Kennedy put a very pro-Trump thing there. And Dan Kennedy with his newsletter, I don't know if you ever noticed a small print at the bottom of uh, one of the final pages. He gives instructions. He doesn't use a lot of tech. He gives instructions about faxing him stuff. Right. <laughs> he uses a fax. But he basically, he in that small print, he, he is... Um, I won't say condescending to his people, but he's very clear. Hey, if you don't include this with your facts, 
I'm throwing it out. Don't expect a response and don't do this to me. I don't have time to deal with this or whatever. He's just very clear. Here's how you do business with me. And he's not afraid to drive people away. A lot of people think, oh, well, I'm paying Dan Kennedy 50 bucks a month for his newsletter or whatever. I can shit on him and treat him like crap. No, he's like, I don't need your money. Here's how you communicate with me. If you don't want to do it, buzz off. Yep. Yeah, I always use the example in my training, uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern. So same thing with Trump, right? Yeah. Nobody's on the fence about Rush Limbaugh or Howard Stern. You love him or yeah. you hate him. You know, there's none of this. Oh, I can take him or leave him. No. <laughs> well, you there's that you Howard. Do you, you ever see the Howard Stern clip? It was on YouTube. The one about uh, he doesn't want your feedback. This, oh no. This whiny guy calls and says, "Yeah, I've got um, a, a suggestion, Howard." And Howard's like, "Doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Cuts him right off." And he goes, no, you got to listen to me. We're a community. He goes, no, I don't. So if I listened to people like you, I wouldn't have a show. Exactly. He's like, go, go call Ryan uh, Seacrest. He cares about what people think. I don't. And it, I recommend people <laughs> check it out. If you'd go on YouTube and look, something like Howard doesn't want, Howard Stern doesn't want your feedback or something like that, you'll find it. That's a perfect, <laughs> that's a perfect way to deal with it. And that's why he's the highest paid guy on the radio is because he doesn't listen to the, the, He's not going for the mushy middle. Yeah, there's a guy I've, I've known for years, uh, Roy Williams down in Austin, uh, and he owns the, um, the Wizard of Ads. Mm. And um, I first went to one of his sessions back in 2002. He's written three New York Times bestsellers. But, you know, he says the risk of insult is the price of clarity. I like it. And it's um, funny you mention that one of my friends up here in Eastern Canada goes to the Wizard of Ads. So the name sounded familiar when you said that. I was like, how do I know it? Then you said Wizard of Ads. I'm like, oh, oh dude. There we go. We should, we should coordinate. Look at the calendar. I'm always looking for an excuse to get down there and find a session you like. I'll go down with you. It's, uh, I love going back to Texas anyway, but. Um, I've never been to Texas, but my goal is to get the South Fork Ranch at some point because I used to love Dallas, the TV show. So I want to go. They have Miss Ali's Deli. I want to go eat at the deli on the ranch. <laughs> well, so a good friend of mine, actually from the Air Force Academy, um, his parents, I think they're still there. They were neighbors. Mm. Um, and so we'd go out there and, and look around, and that was after the show was was over. But uh, he still lives in Fort Worth. I just I don't know if his parents are still there, but. I can meet you there too. So I'm happy to go to Dallas um, as well. Just do not go now. No. Being from Canada, you will step off the airplane into the uh, air out of the terminal and you will just die. You will just spontaneously combust. There will just be yeah. your beard uh, and your iPhone will all that remain. Well, I went to your neck of the woods uh, for a speaking gig last March uh, for social media marketing world. And sure. everyone in San Diego was uh talked about how cold it was they're all like bundled up like oh my god this is horrible me i'm walking around shorts and flip-flops i'm like this is awesome you know this is great and everybody's it was probably 60 huh it was right around say it was beach weather i was the the pasty canadian on the beach but uh everyone else has talked about how horrible it was was like man i grew up in canada like this is awesome (laughs) Uh, well uh so i remember talking about like doesn't want feedback i remember years ago roy I don't know if he put it in his newsletter or was talking about it, but he was like, he had staff that filters the hate mail, right? The hate mail, the feedback, whatever. He says, I don't see it. And I remember thinking, you know, this was years and years ago, thinking like how arrogant and how do you improve? How do you get better? Uh, And then as I grew and grew my business and I realized like it is so debilitating to get the hate mail, you know, and you think like you're putting yourself out there, spend hours, weeks, months on something. And somebody just wants to sharpshoot it. And it's like, if you're surrounded by people that care about you, that they'll find the errors anyway, and hopefully fix them before you hit send. But typos and whatever are part of it anyway. Yeah. Right. I I do my best proofreading, like in the 32 milliseconds, right after I hit send, I'll Mm. find all the errors once it's, uh, Once it goes out to 13,000 people, the, no the problem. Way I, the way I like uh, prefer to deal with uh, hate mail and stuff is screenshot it, but then use it to rile up your people to get them. To right. Defend. So a perfect example of this I just saw recently, John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire. Somebody sure. sent John just a brutal email. It was he 
talked about John's hair or lack of hair. Oh, I remember that. Talked about K. Talked about everything. Just really, oh my God, it was over top. John uh, was very. I'm on John's email list and connect with him on social media. He shared it and said he was very open with it, and he got so much traction. I. I thought, oh my God, I should create my own hate mail for myself, something like that, and put it yeah, out. Yeah, really. But kudos to John for being very open because um, that, that's a freaky thing. This guy sound like a stalker, a guy or gal that sent that message. But anytime I get something like that, I, I post it out there for a couple of reasons. First of all, I like to mock them. That's another Ben Settle thing. Never, you know, or Grant Cardone, never waste a good hater, mm-hmm. uh, hater fuel and stuff. So I put it out there to mock them, but I also do it to show coaches that it's not the end of the world if you get critics, right? So I have had coaches say to me, Mark, thank you for sharing that thing with somebody calling you a complete idiot because, you know, I had a laugh at it and it shows that, you know, you can handle it, rolls off your back and I, it makes me more willing to put my stuff out there. So that's one of the reasons I do it as well. But I'm sure you from having a podcast, you've had these nut bars. I, I had a idiot from South Africa, Johannesburg, once um, sent me a message and I ended up getting so much mileage from that. I should thank him. <laughs> It wasn't quite as bad as John's. It was pretty bad, and uh, that's how I deal with it. I either ignore it, go uh, uh, along with my day, or I will screenshot it. I will use it to get business. I'll put it into my emails, or I'll put it on social media to sell something. Yeah, I do that too. I'll, I'll screenshot it and share it, and uh, partly to encourage others, because if you've never had a hater, uh, it's – it's a little scary. It's a little daunting. It, it can take the wind out of your sails just as soon as you're getting started. And it's like, you know, you yeah. got to be tough. You got to have some thick skin, you know, talk about Trump or Limbaugh or Howard Stern. I mean, they get a lot of hate mail. Oh yeah. Well, right? this, this is a silver lining for my real estate closure. August of 2009 is I got a ton of anonymous, anonymous and not anonymous hate mail. And back then, my local newspaper online, they had zero controls for their commenting. So you could jump on there as um, Monkey Boy 1950 or whatever you want to use for username, and you could say literally anything you want on there. And you would not believe the filth that was going on there. So for me, it it was shitty at the time, but it was also good because I've dealt with so many kooks and idiots in my real estate life that now I'm like, Oh yeah, some guy in a ba- his parents' basement in Boise, Idaho doesn't like me. It's not a big deal. I've been right. dealt with worse. Uh, there is a great book. I recommend people check out. It's called thick face, black heart. And it's my favorite book, but I wish I had known about it back in 2009 with the business closure. I found out about it a few years later. I read it a few times a year. If you want to get a thicker skin, read thick face, black heart by Chin Ning Chu. Wow. I haven't heard of that one. No, and not a lot of people have, you know, it's not like think and grow rich or one of those books. Uh, It's my favorite book and I read a ton of books. The warrior philosophy for conquering the challenges of business and life. Yeah. It's not woo woo. It's not fluff. If you want to manifest your dreams by shooting positive vibrations out of your behind, stick with the secret it is very realistic. It's saying in a nutshell, people, human beings are horrible by nature. Here's how you deal with them. You know, it's right. very realistic. There's no rose colored glasses. Well, that's why I take Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I just choke them unconscious and just leave them in a, their own puddle of drool and dribble. <laughs> <laughs> My son's in Jiu Jitsu. So I'll tell him that when he's older, anyone bugs you just choke him out. <laughs> They only remember what hit them, man. Yeah. It doesn't even hurt. They just go to sleep for a little while. <laughs> I know. I've been choked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, where am I? What the heck just happened? Why is everybody looking at me like this? <laughs> How come I can't really move my body? Yeah, in Canada, we don't fight. You know, we're, we're too polite. Uh, I know. I That's why. That's why I love you, man. That's why I love you. Yeah, but it is tough online. I mean, it's uh, it can be like you say, it can be freaky. Where you got if you're putting your message out there, it's so easy for people to take pot shots. There's a whole crabs in a bucket mentality or tall poppy syndrome and stuff. And um, I my suggestion to my clients, coach I'm working with, is you got to get beat up. You know, it's scary, but just get out there, get beat up. You'll grow a thicker skin. You'll be better off for it. But it's going to take you're going to take some 
virtual hits in the process. Just live with it. Yep. Toughen up. Very nice. And the way they can do that, we'll give them a few resources and that's how we opened up, right? You've got your private group. So it's the coaching jungle, the coaching jungle.com. You got her. Right. Yep. Uh, and then from there, I don't want to overwhelm y'all. Just go there. The coaching jungle.com. Uh, from there, you can find his podcast, uh, natural born coaches podcast, get his book. Um, I link to it as well, uh, in the episode. So, um, I want to be aware of the time. So, Mark, I appreciate you um, taking the time. And uh, I'm serious about going to Austin. If you want to go. Um, Let's head South Fork. We'll get the cowboy hats and, yeah, JR. We can just Bob. do a Texas tour, man. We can go to Dallas, go to South Fork. Uh, we'll head down to, to Austin, get a little marketing conference. Uh, I'll take you to Houston where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll get some barbecue. It, you'll be treated like a king, man. You may cool. never go back. You may just. It, it looks like it. a great state. So it's on my list. All right. Very nice. Well, Mark Mawinney, all the way from Canada, eh? Thanks for coming on the Hello. Sales Podcast, man. Yes. It's been great. Thanks, Wes. How did you like hearing from uh, Luke Skywalker, huh? Or Mark Hamilton? or What's his name? Oh, yeah, Mark. Mark. Uh, Mark Mawinney. Good dude, right? I mean, super humble, modest. Uh, he's got a very successful business. He um, has had two successful businesses at least, right? I mean, he lost one. He was honest about that. Uh, and the lessons he learned, the empathy, uh, you know, failing and bouncing back, fighting back, it does give you character. Uh, it makes you tough. And more people need more character and more toughness, more thick skin, so uh, it was great having Mark on. I, I've known uh, him online for quite some time. And we even, uh, we were supposed to schedule this months and months ago and we were messaging through Facebook and just lost uh, in the in the thread and bounced back and um, got him on. You know, he, he hopped right on. So really nice guy. Uh, if you're looking for a business coach, you know, give him a shout. Uh, give him a look over. Uh, check out his podcast. It may be just what the whisperer ordered. Uh, but, um, I love the way he has niched down. He has narrowed it down. You know, I, I had a niche then I had another niche. Then I got kind of general and I'm back at niching, you know, really focusing on sales training. It's, it's just needed. It applies to everything. He talks about empathy and I love the fact he brought that up because I was, um, you know, talking about it in the beginning. Uh, the the better prospecting system, bonding, empathy, trust, and rapport. Uh, and even if you don't have to pick up the phone anymore, and I don't, you know, I don't have to make cold calls, but I do uh, have people set appointments with me if they pass my sniff test. Like he talks about his three criteria. Uh, I've got the criteria. So, you know, are you able to be empathetic? Uh, just today, as, as I record this, uh, before I head out on a 12-day uh, vacation, I had my uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach over and his wife and helping them with their marketing. And I talked about the, the importance of having a buyer persona, right? Uh, you've got to understand your niche. Who are you going after? Uh, and as we broke it down, um, it was enlightening to them. It was enlightening to me seeing his business from the inside um, and who he wants to go after, who the persona is, uh, and it wasn't who you'd think. So, you know, hey, I have a Brazilian jiu-jitsu mentor. Now he has a marketing mentor. And then we even put some things into practice today when we were done training, uh, getting testimonials, getting people to to do reviews. And, um, you know, but it all boils down to that empathy, knowing what's going on. I've always said this. You know, Robert Carr, you talked about entering the conversation going on in the mind of your prospects. You know, can you do that? That's empathy. Uh, So if you're going through a tough spot right now, keep going. There will be a lesson in there. There will be a benefit. This will help you grow um, down the road. And who knows? Uh, It's hard to tell, but you you just got to keep going. Uh, And having a team, having a coach, it helps you. When I got serious about sales training, you know, I took a 12-week teleclass with a PDF workbook. And then I ended up hiring that coach and becoming his first licensee. Uh, spent thousands of dollars on that. that. That's back in 2006. So, you know, 12 years ago, $10,000 and then 500 a month and 1000 a month. Uh, so 
you don't have to pay that kind of money. Check out MakeEverySale.com. Come join us uh, in this ongoing program to toughen up, uh, get better in your negotiations, uh, get better in your time management, get better in your goal setting, uh, get better in understanding and reading people. I spend a lot of time on that. You know, you don't have to manipulate people. You don't need NLP and hypnosis, but you do have to adjust how you sell to match how the prospect buys. Okay. And that's what I spend a lot of time on. And the Make Every Sale program, you know, I'm talking about giving you the foundation and the confidence to just be calm. You know, it's one thing I always notice when I'm doing jujitsu. You know, I'm rolling with these higher belts and I think I've got them in a good position and they're just so calm. They're literally not stressed. They're not tense. They're not breathing heavy. And I, and I just know it's coming, right? It's like, okay, on a lower belt, they're freaking out and I'm smashing them. Higher belts are like, yeah, whatever. They're so calm because they know. They know the next move. They know that they're prepared that wherever I go, towards their head, towards their feet, to their side, to their arms, to their elbows, to their wrists, to their you know, knees, whatever, they, they've practiced enough that they know they can react and then use that, that movement, my movement, to their advantage. That's what I want you to do in sales is to just be calm. Be in the moment. Uh, and people talk about not wanting to have a script. You know, salespeople will tell me, oh, I feel all constricted and bound up. And, but the reality is when you have a script, just like in jiu-jitsu, we do the script over and over and over again. We know how to escape certain positions. It's a script. In sales, when you know what they're going to say and you know you have a good answer for it, then you know you can disarm that little ticking time bomb and then throw a little ticking time bomb back in their lap. Okay? And, you know, it's not negative. Um, you know, it's just an analogy, right? But it's, it's just hot potato going back and forth. The prospect thinks they're going to just ask you so many questions and stump you. But it's just their defense mechanism. They're scared because they've been abused by so many other salespeople. So are you confident in that moment? And, and this is when most salespeople stress out. They, they freak out. Their demeanor changes. And it's that, it's that change. Okay? It doesn't matter if you talk fast, if you talk slow, if you use big words, if you use little words, if you're very... Uh, laid back and calm in your in your presentations, or if you're very animated, hands flying around, when you change, that's what sends off signals in the mind of the prospect, and they can't put their finger on it. But that's when they're like, eh, "I'm not quite sure. I want to think it over." You know, thank you very much for your presentation. We're gonna we're gonna give this some serious thought. You know, we appreciate your time. We'll get back to you. And you don't even know what the change is. It, you can't see it from from your own. It's so hard to read the label from inside the bottle. It's why you need a coach. It's why you need a mentor. It's why you need to engage somewhere with peers that are helping you. People that are in different industries but have the same issues. And they'll give you unique approaches on how to overcome your toughest issues. Because not only do we meet live every week on the call, there's a private group. And we're all answering one another's questions almost in real time. So come join us, all right? MakeEverySale.com. You'll be glad you did. I mentioned last time, too, if you need a speaker, if you're part of an association, uh, if you've got a company, um, you know, an annual sales meeting, a quarterly meeting, a, a regional meeting, um, let me know pretty please. Check out HireTheBestSpeaker.com. it will take you to my uh, website. Um, you know, spoken around the world, going to Slovenia in November, uh, talking about going to Florida next May, spoken in Vegas, spoken in Phoenix, um, all over the place. So if you've got um, a team, you want to motivate them, inspire them. Uh, you know, I draw on my uh, military background, uh, Air Force Academy, being recruited for football, talking about having a big family. Uh, being in sales for a decade, having my own business for over a decade. So, you know, I'll customize it to your theme uh, and really make it hit home. And then if you need additional help, leading a breakout session or something like that, let's talk. I do that all the time, and I want to do it more. And I want to do it for you. So hit me up, okay? If you've, Again, if you're part of an association, you know of an association, uh, or it's just for your company, um, 
I will come out there and rock their socks. So, hey, thanks for listening. One other thing. I had somebody buy my book this past week, and that's a great thing. I need more of you to do that. Check it out, 79stories.com, 79stories.com. I will autograph it for you for no extra charge. Now go sell something. <laughs>